In 1830s England, a juicy sex scandal broke, which threatened to bring down the government. A beautiful and vivacious socialite, acclaimed songwriter and poet, was accused of having an affair with the Prime Minister. The affair, which might have been never was, did not bring down the government, but it did result in some of the greatest social reforms in English history. Before these reforms, married women did not exist in English law. They had no voice, no opinion, no possessions, and no rights. Reforms of women's rights across the Western world have progressed, with exceptions, much in line with English law, sometimes a little ahead or a little behind. And so this case serves as an example. But before that, Ken Ham. Ham is at it again. And this Luddite of liberal reform proves once again in this post that rather than sabotaging social evolution by throwing his shoes into the machinery of moral progress, he only highlights the continual need to reappraise our ethics by putting his foot firmly in his mouth. Mockery of marriage, runs the ham rant headline. The story behind the rant is a piece of nothing. Apparently two heterosexual male friends in Australia married each other solely to win a radio station prize, which was tickets to the Rugby World Cup in England. A nothing story, but it gave Ham the chance to dust off his tired rhetoric on the biblical institution of marriage. And here he needs a little education. Ham laments that this new story shows the tragic decline of attitudes towards marriage in Western society. What used to be a solemn, sacred covenant between one man and one woman for life has become a means to acquire a contest prize for personal gain. Now, where did Ham get the idea that marriage used to be a solemn, sacred covenant between one man and one woman for life? It cannot be from the Bible that he worships. Abraham had two wives. Jacob had two wives and two concubines. Moses had two wives. Then there were Esau, David, Solomon, Gideon, and more. God even gives details on how to treat your numerous wives and their offspring. Exodus 21.10 states, If he take him another wife, her food, her raiment, and her duty of marriage shall he not diminish. Deuteronomy 17.17 17 tells the king not to have too many wives. Neither shall he multiply wives to himself, that his heart turn not away, neither shall he greatly multiply to himself silver and gold. And Deuteronomy 21 explains how inheritance should work when there are multiple children from multiple wives. And in every case, a wife is given to her new husband. The covenant was between the wife's previous owner, her father, and her new owner, her husband. And the contract always had a financial element. Marriage was for the gain, financial or otherwise, of the men, and the women were the property which was exchanged to achieve that gain. Ham, dragging up his tired old one man, one woman, Jesus quote from Matthew, utterly ignores the fact that his Bible God could, had he wanted to, have enforced any marriage law from day one. He had no problems enforcing a hundred other laws under punishment of death, and wiping all life off the face of the earth when he was ignored, but instead he chose to legislate on the treatment of multiple wives and their offspring, and of course the sale and purchase of brides. A solemn, sacred covenant between one man and one woman. No, through most of written history, upheld by the laws laid down in the Bible, marriage was a business transaction between two men. It might be used to strengthen ties between two tribes, or to curry favour, but women had no legal standing and no say in who they married, unless it was allowed to them by their owner. And so to Victorian England. Victorian England is synonymous with the term Victorian morality, sexual restraint, low tolerance for crime, and strict social codes. Of course, that's all bunkum, and the era was one of utter moral hypocrisy. But let's keep to the script. Caroline and her two sisters, granddaughters of the playwright Sheridan, were beauties, and collectively known as the Three Graces. She was a prolific and successful writer, but her family was considered poor, and she needed to marry well, as was the custom. She married a man she barely knew, the lawyer and Member of Parliament for Guildford, George Norton. Norton resented her intellect, and was a violent man, once beating her to the extent that she miscarried a pregnancy. Caroline could not leave her husband. If she did so, she would lose everything, including the three sons she was evidently devoted to. 
In English law, she did not exist as a person once married and had no rights whatsoever. Even her earnings belonged to her husband and there was no right to divorce available to her. When her husband lost his parliamentary seat, Caroline approached a family friend, Lord Melbourne, then Home Secretary. He obtained a job for Norton as a magistrate. A friendship then grew between Melbourne and Caroline, he visiting her often whilst her husband was at work. This would raise eyebrows even today, and was probably an error of judgment on both their parts at the time, but there is no evidence that the meetings were more than the result of two people flattering each other for differing reasons. In 1836, Caroline left her husband. She lived on her earnings as an author. Her husband then argued successfully in court that her earnings were legally his and she was left penniless. But Caroline was bright as well as beautiful and used the law to her advantage. Using her husband's name and standing, she ran up huge debts and walked away from them, the creditors then suing her husband for the money. Perhaps as a result of this, her husband then abducted her sons first lodging them with his mistress, it was okay for a Victorian gentleman to have a mistress, before removing them to Scotland, making it almost impossible for Caroline to see them. Norton then tried to blackmail, now Prime Minister, Lord Melbourne, before suing him for criminal conversation, adultery. This latter possibly encouraged by Norton's Tory friends. Melbourne was a Whig, and the government was seen as weak at the time. The case was thrown out of court, but the accusation left Caroline's reputation in tatters. She only gained limited access to two of her sons following the death of the youngest in an accident. She then went on a political crusade. Marriage laws, which had until that time come under the purview of the ecclesiastical courts, which upheld the sanctity of marriage, regardless of the abuses women suffered, were finally addressed by the Houses of Parliament. And to keep this story short, resulted in the Custody of Infants Act, 1839, the Matrimonial Causes Act of 1857, addressing divorce, and the Married Women's Property Act of 1870. My great-grandmother was born in 1870. I wonder what her mother's married life was like. Ham's lament is the cry of nostalgia for something which never was, or perhaps... When the serpent came, and did God really say, because they were instructed not to eat the fruit of the tree, or Adam was specifically as, as, as the head. Or Adam was specifically as, as, as the head. As he has evidenced before, he does hanker after a return to a time when women knew their place, their place being silent until sold into a loveless marriage to produce heirs for their new owners. Thank you, as always, for watching.